Welcome back to Precious Blood Renewal Center. As we continue the series of discussions entitled The Discerning Voter, Gospel Values for this Election Season. We will be voting on local, state, and national offices and issues very soon. And I realize some of you may even have already voted. But each week of this series, I have a discussion with someone from the Precious Blood family about the gospel read at that week's Sunday Mass. And we try to discern what's Jesus's core values being taught for us. And then how does that apply to our family relationships and how does that help us discern to make good choices in the voting booth in November? Choices that are in line with the values of Jesus. The policies we promote and the candidates for whom we vote can have enormous effects in the lives of many people. It is primarily in voting for specific candidates for office that believers as citizens have the greatest opportunity to leave the earth better than we found it. I read recently Pope Francis say, we can only fulfill our vocation as faithful citizens if we come to see in the very toxicity of our political culture at the current moment, a call to deeper conversion to Jesus Christ. My name is Father Ron Will. And I am coming to you from Precious Blood Renewal Center in Liberty, Missouri. And this week I am joined by Dennis Keller. Uh, I am a former member of the Missionaries of the Precious Blood, uh, a member of a group called the Amici, which is uh, composed of former seminarians and priests within the society. Uh, and I'm coming to you from Garner, North Carolina, just a little southeast of Raleigh. Welcome, Dennis, all the way across the miles. For, thank you for joining us. Let's begin our time to, with a little prayer, inviting the Holy Spirit to guide our discussion, but also to guide us in making good decisions in the future. You've heard this uh, song before. I invite you to sing along from your homes. Holy Spirit, Come into our lives, Holy Spirit, make us truly wise. Holy Spirit, come into our lives, Holy Spirit, make us truly wise. I'm going to read the gospel that we hear at Sunday Mass, and you may just sit back and listen to it or follow along on your computer screen as it's put there. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. The Pharisees went off and plotted how they might entrap Jesus in speech. They sent their disciples to him with the Herodians saying, teacher, we know that you are a truthful man and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. And you are not concerned with anyone's opinion, for you do not regard a person's status. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it lawful to pay the census tax to Caesar or not? Knowing their malice, Jesus said, Why are you testing me, you hypocrites? Show me the coin that pays the census tax. Then they handed him the Roman coin. He said to them, whose image is this and whose inscription? They replied, Caesar's. At that, he said to them, then repay to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and to God what belongs to God. Dennis, as you hear that gospel read today, what is the primary core teaching of Jesus that you hear? Uh, basically, I think uh, Jesus is telling us that we live in the world and that we have obligations to the world and how it is operated, how it is run. But we also have obligations of faith, which arise not so much from law and rationality, but from issues of the heart. 
where in fact we uh, are either in love with God or we are not. And that is, is uh, mm -hmm. what permeates everything and uh, really helps us decide how to respond to the needs of society. As I listen to that gospel, I'm struck by the question, to whom do I belong? When Jesus looked at the Roman coin, he saw the image of Caesar imprinted on it. We have the image of God imprinted on us. We are created in the image and likeness of God. And because we're baptized, we are baptized into Christ and we're called to put on the mind and the values and the attitude of Christ. So Jesus is telling me, repay to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, but to God, what belongs to God? We belong to God. So I ask myself, are we giving God the worship God deserves? Are we Americans first or Christians first? Some time ago, I heard a preacher say that if we put the flag above the cross, we are in deep trouble. Another way of saying, to whom do we belong? Quite a few years ago, I was having a Sunday mass and at the end of the homily, I walked over to the presider's chair and I invited the congregation to stand for the profession of faith. And I began, I pledge allegiance to the flag <laughs> and the congregation just unconsciously went on automatic pilot and started reciting the pledge to allegiance. And after a paragraph, I said, stop, stop. Do you hear what you're saying? <laughs> We're not pledging allegiance to the flag here. We're professing the creed, profession, our commitment to God. And so we started over. I believe in God the Father, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's easy for us to unconsciously go along with the values of the culture, the society around us, but it takes a deliberate decision, a conscious decision to follow the values, the commitment to God. Pope Francis recently said, to be a Catholic is to be a bit homeless in the world. And before that, Jesus said, as you said, Dennis, we live in the world, but we do not belong to the world. We live by a higher set of standards, and we bring those higher standards to our decisions in our family, in the marketplace, in the political world, and in the voting booth. Dennis, as you listen to this gospel today, is there a situation in your own family or your relationships to which this gospel speaks? Uh, <clears throat> I don't know how to answer that because the answer is yes and no. Uh, the, uh, the youth in my family, or the, our children basically, have uh, pretty much become enamored with the consumer society. Now, they're still in their middle ages and haven't come to the point of wisdom, I suspect. But it bothers me a great deal that, that the traditions that my family passed on to me are sort of being lost. Uh, I have some hope in the grandchildren, uh, but for my own children, I, I am in pain because uh, they are more involved in what the world's all about than, than in what I was taught and what I learned from my mom and dad and from the seminary training. Okay. And as I listen to this gospel, I'm reminded that I should naturally bring attitudes of love and respect to my workplace and family relationships and friendships. Because I belong to Christ, I am called to love and respect others as Christ does. Now, thinking ahead to the voting booth, Dennis, uh, is there a, a situation coming up in the voting uh, to which this gospel speaks to you? Well, yeah, I, th I think the gospel uh, sets the scene for us about sort of the world in which we live. The Pharisees, of course, were very, very into the law and in great detail, and that salvation was through the law of Moses. The Herodians were not so religious. They were actually pretty much in the hand of Rome and found their survival and their prosperity uh, by al aligning themselves with the Roman people. So it's real strange that the Pharisees reached out to the Herodians, 
and decided to do a um, what would you call it a an a, a, a an amalgam between themselves to take Jesus on because you remember in the last couple of weeks Jesus took on the the religious uh, focus of of so much of Judaism and talked about the vineyard and those kinds of things and the failures of uh, Jewish leadership so they were out to get him and they thought they had it because they had both sides of the coin if I can use that phrase uh, they had the, the, the Herodians who, if he said that it was unlawful to pay the, the tribute, the, the census tax, that they would report him uh, back to the procurator and he would be crucified. Uh, whereas if the, if the, the Pharisees, uh, he said it was lawful, the Pharisees would point to him as being not uh, religious. What was interesting is he solved the problem and the dilemma by asking to see the coin. And of course, the coin had the image and the inscription of the current Caesar on it. Uh, and uh, the Jewish people, the Pharisees had one, which is interesting because uh, the Jewish custom and tradition believes that any image is an idolatry. So they, they condemned themselves by their own possessions as it were. Mm -hmm. When Jesus came up with uh, whose, whose image is this, whose inscription is this, and they had no choice but to say Caesar's, he then said, pay Caesar, what is due Caesar? And what does Caesar do in our own situation? What does the state do? Uh, we depend on the state for order uh, out of chaos. We, present, we, pre we, we depend on the state for safety, security, education, health care. Uh, uh, order, uh, trade, all those things we, uh, we depend on the state for. What do we depend on God for? Uh, we depend on God for the very quintessential part of who we are, our life. Uh, the image and likeness that you, you mentioned earlier is, is, makes each one of us unique, uh, a, a one of a kind. So basically, uh, the, what we owe God is thanksgiving, we owe God gratitude, and we owe God love. In Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, he points out that you, he gives thanks to God for the Thessalonians because they are not only persons of faith, they are also persons of work. So that the word that they have received is not an empty word, but a word that is productive, effective, and calls people to action. So with, with that in mind, as we come to the voting booth, uh, we have to sort of discern what's going on, who is best uh, in line with our, our uh, religious uh, faith, our religious practice, our, the, the love and the respect we have for God and for life itself, or we are uh, tied in more with uh, power, wealth, and influence, which are the three temptations of Jesus, as you recall. So when we come to the voting booth, we've been told by so many people, including members of hierarchy and clergy, that the quintessential preeminent issue is abortion. And the terrible part about that is, as uh, Bishop uh, McElroy of San Diego points out, is how do you judge the value of a life between a life of an unborn child and the life of a child trying to cross the Rio Grande and who dies trying to flee from violence? from uh, uh, slavery and, and such like, and from tyranny. How do you measure this? Uh, the, the issue is, is that uh, political people tend to make one item uh, the, 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 the benchmark or the tipping point that we all have to deal with, when the reality of it is life is a heck of a lot more complex than that. So all life is sacred or no life is sacred. Uh, and I think that's one of the things that I learned from this, is that as we uh, come to the voting booth, we need to be very, very concerned about all life and not just one form of life. It strikes me as just sort of disingenuous and a great marketing tool that what has been called anti-abortion is really called pro-life. And yet, if you watch so much of the literature and so much of the of the conversations about this, it's not really pro-life, it's pro-birth. 
And that's only a partial element of what's going on. Um, I guess ultimately Jesus says somewhere along the line that you beware of wolves in sheep's clothing. And I guess I'd like to amend that, even though I'm taking on Jesus' words, <laughs> it's sort of presumptuous. I think we ought to be aware and wary of wolves who dress as shepherds. So there. Okay. <laughs> so you are challenging us, as Jesus does, to look at the big picture. Yeah. And as I hear this uh, gospel myself, uh, I ask, where are the candidates' core values coming from? Do they have any uh, involvement in any faith community? It doesn't have to be my faith community, but if they are involved in some faith community, he or she is more likely to be influenced by core values in tune with God. So I want candidates who are concerned about protection of religious liberty, not only so that I'm free to worship myself, but also free to express my religious beliefs in the public forum. Faithful voting involves careful consideration of the specific ability of a particular candidate to actually advance the common good. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, the Bishop McGalroy is the one who said this that you refer to in making this assessment, opportunity, competence, and character all come into play. Political leaders, especially at the highest levels, imprint their character in pivotal ways upon the entire political culture and thus on society itself. I recently became aware of an organization called Vote Common Good, and they suggest measuring the presidential candidates against the seven cardinal virtues and the seven capital sins. The seven cardinal virtues are kindness, generosity, humility, chastity, modesty, diligence, and patience. And the seven capital sins are lust, sloth, greed, wrath, gluttony, envy, and pride. So they're suggesting to put those alongside the candidates and to measure them. It's, it's an interesting way of evaluating them. Uh, I never thought of that before, but, but I kind of like it. And not just for presidential candidates, but for all offices. <laughs> Dennis, is there anything else that you'd like to add for our discussion? Yeah. Just one other point uh, uh, from the first reading for this coming Sunday. Uh, it's, it's from Isaiah, and it's in the third section of Isaiah which is about them coming back to Jerusalem and rebuilding the temple and the walls, etc. And it is, it is God speaking to one Cyrus, Cyrus the Great, the Persian conqueror, and, and saying, I have anointed you, which means you are the Messiah. The people uh, in exile in Babylon really came to a religious reawakening. Uh, that's when the Pentateuch was put together and uh, their religious customs and their religious practices and their feast days were all uh, kept them together, made them one unit. Uh, they would have expected someone from their own group to be the Messiah that would save them from this captivity. And yet God reached out and pointed to Cyrus a conqueror, a violent man who had overcome kingdoms uh, all throughout the Middle East. And he became the Messiah for the promised land, for the co chosen people to return them to their homeland. Uh, it, it struck me that God chooses whomever he chooses, uh, that we don't necessarily know who the Messiah for this age is and that we ought to really be open to understanding God's action and the fact that God is present even in the darkest of days. God somehow finds a way. Uh, and having that faith, uh, the faith that God loves us individually and collectively, that God saves us, that God intervenes, that God shows us the way forward if we only pay attention. So that's, that's my sort of thought about the first reading. Very good thoughts. 
One other thought I want to add is that the Kansas City Province Provincial Leadership recently published a statement regarding voting. And part of that statement says, in a perfect world, there would be ideal political candidates whom we could choose from. But no candidate is perfect and no candidate models all our values. That means we must decide which candidates come closer to living these values and vote for them. This is hard work. And it would be easier to cast our vote based simply on one party or one person or one issue. But that would be shirking our personal moral responsibility to make our choices based on all the values we hold dear in which the gospel calls us to uphold. So again, as I said previously, I hope that you are doing some studying before you go to the voting booth about the different candidates. Don't just listen to the campaign ads you probably hear on television, but uh, learn a little bit about them and make sure you know who's going to be on the ballot and what issues are going to be on the ballot before you go to the voting booth. And another reminder that if you Google ballotpedia.org and type in your street and city address, it will bring up all the ballot issues and candidates for which you will vote in November in your area. I encourage you to do so and study the candidates now if you haven't already done so. Thank you once again for joining us and joining us in this past several weeks of discussions. I invite you to please join me again next Tuesday for the last session in this series as we go through a process of wrapping up and tying together all the things we have covered during these discussions. Let's close our time today with a prayer. Gracious and loving God, let your spirit guide all candidates on the November ballot. Drawing on the resources of faith, we pray that each runs their, can their campaign with civility. Inspire each to use this opportunity to shape a society more respectful of life, dignity, and rights of the human person, especially the poor and vulnerable. Amen. Amen. Dennis, thank you so much for joining me today, and thank all of you for tuning in. See you next week. God bless. Thank you, Father Ron.